Hello there mudlarking friends. Well, this week, as you can see, I'm not down on the foreshore and we're gonna have something a little bit different. Last year, I gave a presentation for the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich. And the topic was Greenwich in 50 objects. It was an idea conceived by Rich Sylvester. He's a storyteller and historian. He asked me along to talk about mudlarking, five objects that I have found that related specifically to Greenwich and its history. So what follows is the presentation I gave. I know some of you couldn't make it um, at the time and it was broadcast live, but I thought what better way for you to see it than for me to recreate it. So here we go. It's five objects I've found while mudlarking that I have tied specifically to Greenwich through their history. Okay, let's go. Coming in at number one, we have the fishing industry from Fisher Lane to Billingsgate Dock. Let's kick off with a common item in day-to-day -day use, sea fishing hooks. These spaded hooks, tied onto nets in large quantities, date from the 19th to the 20th century. And similar hooks are still used in deep sea fishing today. The fishing hooks here may have a direct link back to the fishing trade that once thrived at Greenwich, specifically from Ship Dock to Billingsgate Dock, not to be confused with Billingsgate Market of today. This 1746 map by John Rock shows the area which once most likely accommodated both fishing smacks for sea fishing and peter boats for Thames and estuary fishing. This small area of Greenwich was used by the fishing fraternity and by the 17th century there was allegedly a small fish market at the eastern end of Fisher Lane, which we know today as the Greenwich Pier area. In 1700 a royal charter market was assigned to the commissioners of Greenwich Hospital. Curiously, the lease was for a period of a thousand years. Now that's the very same market, although in a different location, that we know as Greenwich Market today. The Charter Market officially opened in 1737 and Greenwich fishermen were allowed to sell their catch there. The market was a success at first, but over half the sellers came from other parts of London and by the end of the 1760s, rent had to be lowered to attract more local stallholders. In 1764, works on the Greenwich Hospital Infirmary started, which meant that the ever-growing market spilled out into neighbouring areas whose dark streets and alleyways made it a difficult place to police. The Greenwich fishermen shifted pitch back to Ship Dock and continued to sell there until the dock, ship stairs and most of Fisher Lane disappeared under the government-enabled Greenwich Hospital Improvement Acts of 1830 to 1850. At this point, Billingsgate Dock was enlarged and, to this very day, that public act of local application in Parliament means that Billingsgate Dock, in place of Ship Dock and Ship Stairs, is, and I quote, for the use of watermen and other persons resorting to and using the same. In other words, Billingsgate Dock was and still is for public use, as all evidence points to the Act having never been repealed. Thanks to the local markets and the transportation of goods further into central London, fishing was a flourishing trade in the early to mid-19th century. The Thames was full of herring and white bait, which was fished and sold both at market and riverside public houses. Sadly, it wasn't too long before the Greenwich fishing industry was on the wane. By the mid-19th century, the rise of the Industrial Revolution and the expansion of railways saw huge quantities of fish being transported by train from the large fishing port of Grimsby. Indeed, many Greenwich fishermen up and moved with their families to make the most of the burgeoning North Sea fishing industry. In her article, Greenwich, Fish and Billingsgate Dock, Barbara Ludlow writes, New markets and new inventions killed off the Greenwich deep sea fishing industry, ironically, just as the demand for fresh fish exploded, with the opening of a great number of fish and chip shops. She also goes on to quote from the 1893 Dickens Dictionary of the Thames, Many of the fishermen have left the river for other more profitable pursuits, and there has scarcely been a youth apprenticed to the calling of fishermen for the last few years. So are these fishing hooks here the last tangible remnants of the Greenwich fishing industry? If you're interested in finding more out about fishermen of Greenwich, check out Julie Tadman's book, The Life and Times of William George Bracegirdle, great name, who was based at Ballast Quay. Julie is his third great-granddaughter. I'd also like to mention Greenwich Industrial History as a great research resource. You can find them online. Details in the video description here. 
And this is number two. Beautiful objects linked to an ugly past. Now let's look at an apparently harmless yet extremely powerful item. Decorative glass beads. Intricate, beautifully crafted, highly sought after. These little works of art facilitated an alternative source of currency used by European traders throughout the world, particularly in West Africa. I found these beads on the Greenwich foreshore, but how did they come to be in the Thames? Perhaps they were chucked in the river once traders returned, a bit like disposing of loose change after a foreign holiday. But given their value, it's more likely that they were dropped from pockets and bags when travellers and traders disembarked. These highly decorated beads generally date from the 16th to 20th century, and despite being attractive items to look at, they carry links to an inhumane past, the transatlantic slave trade. Anne Yench of Armstrong State College in Georgia succinctly describes trade beads as silent witnesses of the past, and I think that's just spot on. You see, although their correct name is trade beads, they also had colloquial names and were also commonly known as slave beads. This alternative currency became so popular that quite literally tons of these trade beads were being produced. But why glass beads? Well, the Society of Bead Researchers states that the competition within the 18th century slave trade forced traders to search for barter cargo that would attract preferential attention from African slave suppliers. Although it's documented that powder glass beads were already being made in Ghana, glass making was not common in all parts of Africa and there was a high demand for these unusual and precious items. But at what true cost? References in early European documents show the importance of glass beads in West African societies and the advent of mass bead production saw the trade in Africa reach unprecedented proportions. These brightly coloured glass beads with complex patterns fitted with the demand that African cultures had for personal adornment. Trade beads were mostly made in mainland Europe, particularly Murano, Venice, Bohemia and the Netherlands. Although there is one London glass bead maker on record, and that is Sir Nicholas Crisp, based in Fulham. So this is how it works. Picture a trade ship leaving from London, the famous Henrietta Marie slave ship for example. In the outbound trip, the bees would be used as part of the ship's ballast, and it meant that from the off, passage to foreign lands would be made easier with such sought-after items on board. Records show that the beads could be exchanged for services and goods such as palm oil, ivory and gold, as well as what was termed human cargo, that's enslaved people. Obviously, this is such a huge subject that I could only briefly touch on in the time allowed. So I'll end this section with a couple of facts taken from the Royal Museum's Greenwich website. Fact number one. Between 1666 and 1807, British and British colonial ships purchased an estimated 3,415,500 Africans. Fact number two. Between 1699 and 1807, British and British colonial ports mounted 12,103 slaving voyages, with 3,351 of those setting out from London. Now, that is something to bear in mind when you next see a tiny decorated glass bead. For more information on London and the Atlantic slave trade, please take a look at the links I've included in the information box of this video. Also, please check out my links to information about Ignatius Sancho, who was himself born on a slave ship bound for Greenwich and became a writer, composer and was the first known person of black heritage to vote in a British election. Object number three. Lucket and Stubbs, pipe makers of Greenwich. One of the most common things found on the River Thames foreshore is the humble clay pipe. Although we don't always find them in their entirety, even a fragment of pipe stem can give a lot of clues as to its origin, especially when it has a maker's mark on it. These clay pipes from Greenwich have kindly been loaned to us by Nicola White, fellow artist and mudlark, also known as Tideline Art, and she is something of a pipe lady, with many complete and incomplete pipes in her collection. On the pipes here, you can see the maker on one side, the location on the other. There was once an abundance of pipe makers in the Royal Borough of Greenwich, which covers makers in Plumstead, Deptford and Woolwich. I'd like to focus on two of them, Jephthah Stubbs, and William Luckett. 
Thomas Jephthah Stubbs, born in 1840, came from a family of pipe makers and by 1861 was a tobacco pipe manufacturer himself. He lived with his twice widowed mother, brothers and a number of other family members at 31 Prince's Road in Plumstead and later with his wife at number 22. Members of the Stubbs family were involved in manufacturing the pipes, with the men, women and children all helping in the workshop. Prince's Road housed something of a pipe-making empire, not least due to the Stubbs family. You see, down the road we also had a few houses along, at number 47, the Luckett family. That's George and Jane, plus their eight children, including one William, who, in 1881, at the age of 16, gave up employment as a factory hand to become a pipe maker. Could this have been due to the influence of his neighbours, the pipe-making Stubbs family? We can't say for sure, but once involved, Luckett went on making pipes for at least another 30 years. By the turn of the century, William and Jane Luckett had moved to Palmerston Road and taken in a boarder named John Longworth. Jane and John were both assisting William in the pipe-making business, as we see from later census entries. Now, although the pipes were in high demand, it by no means meant that the career was a lucrative one. We know this from information given by William Luckett's grandson, John McLean. He revealed the following about his grandfather in an article on Greenwich Industrial History. Grandad mainly made pipes for the beer industry, and later tobacconists. His pipes were given to customers who bought a pint of porter in the pubs. He received four pence a gross for his pipes, from which you will understand that he was unlikely to be a rich man. By my reckoning, that's four pence per 144 pipes. As Nicola White points out in her detailed research, many pipe makers struggled to make a living for a variety of reasons, but especially because there was such a lot of competition. By the middle of the 17th century, there were at least a thousand pipe makers in London alone, and many others operating in towns and cities. It was not unusual for pipe makers to travel from town to town to escape this extreme competition. According to John McLean, William Luckett built his own kiln at Palmerston Road and in addition to having china clay imported from Cornwall, was perhaps using local clay from a nearby site of a brick and tile works. What follows is a description of William Luckett's pipe workshop. Pictures here are of Brosley Pipe Works in Staffordshire. There was an all-pervading smell in the workshop, not at all unpleasant, and I can remember seeing rack after rack of pipes of varying shapes and sizes in the roof space. Grandad built the kiln himself, and it was a bit like Dante's Inferno. It used a chain-lifted cast-iron bucket full of pipes which was lowered into a coke fire. It all worked beautifully. Little and large clay pipes emerged. The chimney of the furnace was incredible. He had used anything available to construct it. Bricks, bits of glass, rock, porcelain, you name it, Grandad used it. In the 20th century, pipe tobacco smoking was going out of fashion and we see the trade begin to die out completely. There are still a handful of clay pipe makers left to this day, but they are few and far between. Rex Key at Brosley Pipeworks is one of those makers. Links as ever in the video details. To find out more about the life of Jep the Stubbs, please check out Nicola White's blog about him. You can also see more of her finds at www.tidelineart.com and on her YouTube channel, Tideline Art. And links for everything mentioned, as ever, will be in the video description. Object 4. From ordnance storage to prison hulks. Here are two buttons, both found on the Greenwich foreshore, linking us directly to global maritime history with deep-rooted links to Greenwich. The button on the left is of the Royal Board of Ordnance, a British government body established in the Tudor period. The button dates from 1790 to 1802 and depicts the shield of the Board of Ordnance, showing three left-pointing cannon vertically stacked on a horizontally striated shield. This button links directly to a place once known as the Warren, quite literally a Tudor domestic warren, which is a man-made warren dedicated to the raising of rabbits for meat and fur. During the mid-17th century, this land at Woolwich was acquired by the Board of Ordnance and was put to use as a proving ground and a gun and ordnance store. Nearby Tower Palace was also acquired in exchange for Gun Wharf, the original site of Woolwich Dockyard, and a vast amount of cash. 
1671, it was declared as a convenient place for building a storehouse for powder and other stores of war, and for room for the proof of guns. Approximately 1,000 cannons and 10,000 cannonballs were transferred from the Tower of London and Minories to the Warren at Woolwich, and from 1688, all new ordnance was kept there. Woolwich Warren was later renamed the Royal Arsenal and continued to serve as our principal ordnance depot until the mid 20th century. The second button I'd like to show you is this Honourable East India Company button, dated from 1830 onwards. Now there's one just like this in the Royal Museum's Greenwich Collection, so if you search that on their website you'll be able to find the exact same button. Finding this button on the Greenwich Peninsula has taken me on a long journey of research of the EIC Navy, journeying from Deptford to Australia via the East Indies and ending up at Woolwich. The Honourable East India Company was our largest royally chartered trade company, which, although coming relatively late to the trade, serviced our expansion and industry in the East Indies from 1600. Not only did the EIC rise to account for an enormous amount of world trade, particularly in basic commodities including fabrics, tea and opium, the company also ruled the beginnings of the British Empire in India. Of all the ships commissioned by the East India Company Navy, a number of them met the same end. They served as prison hulks. It's incredible to think that these ships, which sailed around the world aiding British trade and expansion, were ultimately retired as floating prisons to contain people in one static spot. Two ships in particular, the Hindustan and the Dromedary, became Royal Navy prison ships for the containment and transportation of prisoners. The Dromedary, launched as an India man in 1799, was refitted as a convict ship in 1819 and, under Captain Richard Skinner, she sailed for Australia and Bermuda, transporting over 470 convicts in total. The Hindustan, who also started life as an India man, underwent a refit at East India Dock and, in 1833 also became a convict ship. Commanded by the celebrated mariner F.W.R. Sadler, she sailed to Australia with 180 female convicts on board. Unlike the dromedary, who ended life as a prison hulk in Bermuda, the Hindustan returned and remained at Greenwich, becoming a floating prison hulk named the Justicia. In July 1777, a correspondent from Scots magazine gave an account of the employment and treatment of the convicts employed in ballast heaving on the Justicia. Carpenters are employed in repairing the hulk. They have fetters on each leg with a chain between that ties variously, some round their middle, others upright to the throat, others, whose crimes have been enormous, chained with heavy fetters. Six or seven guards continually walk around with them with drawn cutlasses to prevent their escape and likewise prevent idleness. The Greenwich prison hulks were always meant to be a temporary measure and in 1857, according to the final expiry of the 1776 Act of Parliament, prison hulks were no longer used. And finally, object objects. A collection of objects for number five. Crime and defence on the foreshore. The last of my selected Greenwich foreshore finds to show you is my little armoury. A collection of the remnants of war, battle and crime from 18th century lead shot, World War II anti-aircraft shrapnel through to modern bullets and even air pistol pellets. There are a number of reasons that this lot has come to end up on the foreshore. From the obvious, criminal activity, to the essential, defence of the realm, the river has seen it all. In this photo you can see the following. Lead shot from weapons such as muskets, percussion pocket revolvers, buckshot loads. The larger ball there is a cannon grape shot. We also have British 303 bullet cases, first conceived in 1888 and immediately adopted as the standard service rifle round for the British Empire. And, as well as impacted bullets, air gun pellets and 12-bore shotgun shell rim, crime surely, we've also got my favourite of the lot, World War II anti-aircraft missile shrapnel. Of course, it's hard to say how each of these finds link to Greenwich individually, but we can have a go. The lead shot being the most difficult of all. 
It was said that any nobleman worth their salt would be a musket-toting gent in the 1800s, as presumably would the robbers and highwaymen, so the lead shot is for sure hard to trace. But if we look at Greenwich and ordnance as a whole, particularly World War I and World War II, we find a number of fascinating links. During peacetime, Woolwich Arsenal was still active, continuing as our main ordnance depot, and by the start of World War I, the arsenal covered almost two square miles, and by 1917, employed in the region of 80,000 munitions workers, half of whom were women. The women, munitionettes as they were known, were recruited as a new government initiative to improve production levels. It was an appeal to females to register for war service work. As a result, thousands of women volunteered for this dangerous, physically demanding job. The munitionettes had another nickname, the Canary Girls, so called because the continued handling of explosive chemicals stained their hair and skin yellow. And if you were unlucky enough, you might just end up with TNT poisoning if you haven't blown yourself up already. We also know that in World War II there were surface-to-air missile launchers based at Greenwich, and that I have found a curious connection to. The Z battery was a short-range anti-aircraft weapon, and although the missiles were developed in Kent, and the propellant was made in Scotland, the missile bodies were made in Greenwich by G. A. Harvey and Co. G. A. Harvey was a metalworking firm, usually manufacturing ordinary things like tanks and systems. G. A. Harvey himself is on record as saying the company started life in the most auspicious way possible, with an old forge in Lewisham. You won't be surprised to know that this ordinary, albeit now large firm, did not actually advertise the manufacture of missile shells. One other subject I'd like to briefly touch on, as it might account for some of the ordnance myself and others find in the Thames, is the tragic explosion at Silvertown Munitions Factory, triggered after a fire broke out in the melt pot room. Approximately 50 tonnes of TNT ignited and immediately flattened the TNT plant, killing 73 people. The reach of the explosion was enormous. It flattened nearby buildings, including the fire station, and debris was strewn for miles around. Burning chunks of rubble caused additional fires in the area. It also reached Greenwich, damaging the gasometer on the Greenwich Peninsula and created a fireball of 200,000 cubic metres. One of the victims of the explosion was PC Edward George Brown Greenoff, who, despite the obvious risk, ran towards the fire to assist with the evacuation of factory workers. A plank to Greenoff can be found at one of my favourite memorial spots in London, Postman's Park, where people who died trying to save others are commemorated. So, although I can't say for sure exactly where each piece of ordnance in my armoury started life, it certainly has opened doors to many avenues of Greenwich social history. OK, everyone, well, I hope you enjoyed that. Thanks for tuning in. I will be back on the foreshore again soon. If you'd like to find out more about any of the projects I've discussed in this video, please have a look at the video details. I will include links in there to everything mentioned in the talk. And there is also a larger project Greenwich in a hundred objects that Rich started quite some time ago. It's well worth checking that out. So the, the Greenwich in 50 objects was tailored specifically for the National Maritime Museum. So check out Greenwich in a hundred objects. You won't be disappointed. Thanks for watching.